tonight to celebrate the life of Hugo Chavez and to show our support for the Venezuelan, the Bolivarian revolution. So the first speaker is going to be John Peterson from Hands Off Venezuela. All right. Well, thanks everyone for coming out tonight. Uh, around the world, there's, uh, there's genuine grief and mourning uh, upon you know, Hugo Chavez's death. People were on the streets in many cities all around the world crying in Venezuela. Tens of thousands of people were out there uh, gathering in the different Bolivar uh, plazas. Uh, and he was an enormous inspiration to people when he was alive and even today now that he's, he's passed on. Why, why is this the case? I mean, in the last few years, there haven't been that many people that have been so polarizing in, in uh, such a positive way. Uh, obviously, we all know about George Bush and other people like that, but I mean, the polar opposite of that for many people was, was Hugo Chavez. And I think, simply put, Chavez represented the aspirations of millions of ordinary people in Venezuela, throughout Latin America, and around the world. Now, if we really want to understand uh, the, the whole Chavez phenomenon, if you will, you really have to go back to the Spanish conquest a little over 500 years ago. Now, obviously, we don't have time to go over that in much detail tonight, but let's shoot ahead a few hundred years to the era of Simón Bolívar. Simón Bolívar, who is one of, the, uh, one of the, the freedom fighters of Latin America, if you will, who, who led uh, big parts of South America in their revolutionary wars to get free from Spanish control, uh, he had a vision of what he called Gran Colombia, the big Colombia, uh, that would unite many of, of the present day countries of, uh, of South America. He never had this narrow vision of these individual countries artificially chopped up uh, and, and competing against each other and uh, you know, being able to be divided and conquered by foreign powers. But after he died, uh, his vision was betrayed and uh, all these countries got diced up into to smaller component parts uh, with different generals taking over different uh, countries. And uh, for many, many years, for decades really, that, uh, that vision was lost. But we now have a revival of this vision of Bolivar. Uh, you could call it uh, Bolivarianism of the 21st century. Uh, it's, a, it's a different kind of, of Bolivarianism in the sense that now the ideas being put forward are the ideas of anti-imperialism, of anti-capitalism, of pro-socialism, of empowering ordinary uh, people to actually do something about the conditions they live in themselves. Now, to give a, a brief history of the last period of, uh, of Venezuela's history and of Chavez himself, Chavez was, uh, he grew up poor. He grew, in a, grew up in a rural area called Barinas uh, from the town of Sabaneta. Uh, and he decided at a young age that he wanted to have a career in the military. He became a paratrooper, became an officer, and he served in, in various posts around the country. But he increasingly came to understand that the military was being used to repress uh, ordinary people in that country, and he had not signed up for that, basically. He had gotten involved and interested in, uh, in left-wing ideas when he was uh, actually still in military school, <coughs> and he started coming up with, with uh, a plan, basically, to turn things around. He was inspired by other revolutionary generals and leaders across uh, Latin America, in South America, Central America, and so on, and he organized sort of a, a group within the military called the MBR 200, which aimed to eventually one day, uh, you know, take power in the name of the poor and the oppressed. Now, in 1989, there was an incident that happened in Venezuela, and similar to what we're seeing around the world today, where you have austerity, we have the IMF and the World Bank and all these institutions coming in and imposing austerity on people. They did this to Venezuela back in 1989. Energy prices doubled, transportation prices doubled, and people had just basically had enough. There was a spontaneous uprising. Uh, people came down from the, from the hills of Caracas and, uh, and started looting. The, uh, the military was called out. Hundreds, if not th thousands of people were killed. And Chavez at that point decided, I'm not going to fight for this government anymore. He didn't per personally participate in those, uh, those attacks, but uh, you know, the military as a whole did. And he decided to do something about it. So in 1992, Chavez organizes a coup. Now this coup was unsuccessful, but he took responsibility for it and was seen as a kind of a, a folk hero by ordinary Venezuelans 
who, uh, who, upon his release just two years later, <laughs> due to popular pressure, rallied around him to, to form a new political movement. Uh, and they started building a, a, a mass political movement. He traveled for 100 days, visiting all the different regions of the country to, to build up this movement. And he was eventually elected president in 1998. Um, soon after being elected president, he followed through on one of his campaign promises, which was to convene a constituent assembly uh, made up of various representatives from all layers of society to produce a new constitution. Uh, so he was elected as president of the Fourth Republic of Venezuela, it was called. But upon ratification of this new constitution, he immediately called new elections and said, I now need to be ratified under the new constitution. So uh, the Constitution was adopted in 1999. In 2000, he's reelected. Uh, and this is when he starts to try and do a few things to help ordinary Venezuelans. Now, if anybody here has seen the movie The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, you'll, you know more or less what ended up happening when he started moving against the entrenched interests uh, that had controlled the vast oil wealth of Venezuela. I forgot to mention, Venezuela happens to be one of the most uh, oil-rich countries in the earth, which on the planet, which obviously makes it of great interest uh, to certain parties uh, in other parts of this planet. So in 2002, there was a coup against Chavez. It was all orchestrated. It's shown in that movie, The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, highly recommended. And the, what saved Chavez, literally what saved his life, and what saved this revolutionary process was the ordinary Venezuelan people who came out in droves and said, you know, we elected this guy, we'll decide when we get rid of him, uh, you, you don't have that right. They brought Chavez back, and uh, this was one of the, uh, a really important turning point, this is one of the first times in the history of Latin America that you've seen anything like that happen, uh, where the masses actually reversed a coup that was already in power, already recognized by, by uh, the State Department, by George Bush. Now, in 2002, later on, the oligarchy, which is the ruling class in Venezuela, they orchestrated uh, a sabotage and lockout of the oil industry to try and cripple the government. Again, ordinary Venezuelans came out, took back the oil industry. In 2005, they tried a recall election against Chavez. That was defeated once again by, by, uh, by the masses coming out. In 2006, elections again. Again, he's elected overwhelmingly millions of people on the street. In 2007, he launches the PSUV, the Unified Socialist Party of Venezuela, in order to try and unify all these struggles into one political vehicle. Uh, there's a series of constitutional referendums, most of which he won. Uh, and then after that, uh, it takes us up more or less to the most recent elections last year in 2012, which he again won handily by an even bigger margin uh, than in the past. But very shortly thereafter, his cancer, which had been in remission, came back, he went to Cuba for treatment, uh, and shortly thereafter, uh, after coming back from Venezuela, he ended up dying. You, you might have seen that at every stage here, uh, it's the role of the ordinary Venezuelans that has been decisive. They have come out. And I think the most important thing about Hugo Chavez is that relationship, that dynamic relationship with uh, ordinary people. As a lot of people in Venezuela say, they say, one man can't make a revolution. And now that he's dead, the slogans are, are along the lines of, Chavez isn't dead, we are now all Chavez. Chavez is the people, and we're going to continue this, this revolutionary process. Now Chavez, as I said, he revived all kinds of ideas. Uh, the ideas of socialism, for example, which hadn't been talked about in a serious way by a world leader since the collapse of the, uh, of the USSR. He stood up to George Bush, he stood up to the arrogance of, the, of these imperialists at the same time that Iraq was being attacked. He revived the question of nationalizations of industry in, in Venezuela, <coughs> of workers' control, of direct participatory democracy, of health care, uh, food, and education as a right for all, of redistributing the oil wealth, using wealth from the country to build hospitals and schools and housing and things like that that obviously uh, in these times of austerity around the world are, are very inspiring that a country as relatively poor as Venezuela could do that. Uh, a lot of people th seem to think that a revolution either has to be 100% perfect or it's not, it's, it's no good. Now, there's problems in Venezuela. There's, there's no doubt about that. But if you look at the concrete achievements that have been made, uh, I think they're enormous. And, uh, and I think that these achievements are going to remain, and they're going to deepen and continue if ordinary Venezuelans have anything to say about it. Now, there's a lot of dangers to the revolution. There is, of course, the question of external meddling. But above all, I think the biggest danger is in internal uh, you know, elements within the government 
a bureaucracy who want Chavismo without Chavez, and they want to put the brakes on this process. Now, in my opinion, the revolution has not yet been completed. It has to uh, take up questions, for example, uh, the nationalization of the banks, the nationalization of the key levers of the economy, of the industry, and of the latifundios, the big landed estates that are still in private hands. Now, the Hands Up Venezuela campaign has been active since 2002, uh, back when the coup happened with Chavez. Uh, it's a campaign around the world that's been recognized uh, by Chavez himself. And the, what the people say in Venezuela to us uh, who have been active with this campaign for all this time is that uh, the best way to keep hands off Venezuela, the best way to ensure that ordinary Venezuelans have the right to determine their own destiny, to determine their own future, is if things are changed in the United States. And I think that uh, hands off Venezuela isn't just about, you know, oh, you know, we must uh, pour people down in, in, you know, in the third world, we have to help them. It's uh, also about how much we can learn about this revolutionary process, what we can learn about things like workers' control and nationalizations and, you know, direct participatory democracy and, and how ordinary people can take things into their own hands and don't have to allow uh, the, the system and the government to determine our destinies. So I urge you all to learn more about the campaign and uh, I look forward to hearing all the great things that everyone else is going to say. Thank you. Next up, we'll hear from Linda Hoover from the Minnesota Peace Action Coalition. Thank you. Uh, pretty much what I want to do tonight is summarize an article that was written by uh, Professor James Petrus, and it was published on the uh, globalresearch.ca, CA for Canada website. And he talks about 12 of the major contributions that uh, President Hugo Chavez uh, has given us for the 21st century, and he calls Chavez the 21st century Renaissance man. So in this essay, Petrus highlights what he calls 12 world historic contributions that Chavez made in the spheres of political economy, ethics, and international law, and in redefining the relations between political leaders and citizens, which John referred to. So I'm going to run through the 12. Number one, Chavez was a great teacher of civic values. His speeches raised the level the cultural level of millions of Venezuelans who had been raised in the alienating and servile culture of imperial Washington. Two, in international relations, the Chavez Doctrine upheld the Geneva Accords against colonial and imperial aggression while rejecting the imperial doctrine of the war on terror. He defined Western state terrorism as equivalent to Al Qaeda terrorism. He was a grand synthesizer of political theory and practice as he summarized the political messages of popular Christianity, Bolivarian nationalist and regionalist integration, and the Marxist political, social, and economic thought. Four, Chavez offered practical alternatives to neoliberalism and imperialism that showed many of the contemporary political and economic problems can be successfully resolved. Chavez supported the radical reform of the Rentier state. The petro industry was socialized, royalty and tax payments were raised, and the funds were used for social services for the majority of the Venezuelans. Number six, Chavez showed a positive alternative to the austerity measures of most countries to the economic crisis. Venezuela taxed the rich, promoted public investments, and maintained social expenditures. Seven, Chavez showed there can be positive social transformation in a globalized economy. That what is decisive is the class character of the regime managing its place in the world economy. Eight, Chavez demonstrated that it is possible to transform from a failed neoliberal to a dynamic welfare state. Nine, he gave us a radical definition of post-neoliberalism by posing a socialized welfare state as an alternative. Number 10, he opened a new and extraordinarily original and complex path to socialism based on free elections, re-educating the military to uphold democratic and constitutional principles, and the development of mass and community media. 11, he popularized the connection between social democracy and national security he created the political consciousness that motivated millions of workers 
and secured the constitutional loyalty of the military to defeat a bloody U.S.-backed business military coup in 2002. And finally, 12, the one I'm going to talk most about is his uh, anti-imperialism in an era of imperialist offensive. In a time when the U.S. and the European Union imperialist ex, uh, offensive that involves, one, a preemptive military invasion, mercenary interventions, torture, assassination, and drone warfare in Iraq, Mali, Syria, Yemen, Libya, and Afghanistan, and brutal economic sanctions and sabotage against Iran. In this time when the Israeli colonial uh, rulers have uh, expelled many Palestinians, and this has been financed by the United States. And in a time when the U.S.-backed military coups in Honduras and Paraguay and the aborted revolutions via puppets in Egypt and Tunisia, Chavez stood as the principal defender of an anti-imperialist politics. His deep commitment to anti-imperialism stands in contrast to the Western self-styled Marxist intellectuals who supported NATO bombing in Yugoslavia and Libya, the French invasion of Mali, and the Saudi French funding and arming of Islamist mercenaries against Syria. Chavez articulated the most profound and significant principles of the 20th and 21st century Marxism the right to self-determination of oppressed nations, and the unconditional opposition to imperial war. He spoke and acted in defense of anti-imperialist principles. So Petrus concludes by saying, in part, that faced with a violent world of imperial counter-revolution and resolve, and he was resolved to stand with the oppressed of the world, he enters world history as a complete political leader with the stature of the most humane and multifaceted leader of our epoch. He is the Renaissance figure of the 21st century. Thanks for being here and allowing me to speak on behalf of uh, the Minnesota Peace Action Coalition. And next we're going to hear from Marcial Castro, who has worked with the Hands Off Honduras Committee and is a native of Honduras. Good evening to everyone here. Um, thank you for being here um, to celebrate the life of Hugo Chavez. I say the life because um, all the good thing he did is to think that for all Latin American people, millions of Latin American people, he didn't die. Because he left, left a legacy all over, you know, uh, America, the continent, and the, even United States. But I also want to talk a, a little bit about um, the implication that the Bolivarian Revolution have in Honduras. As a Honduras, um, I am representing here the, um, the diaspora, diaspora of the Honduran people organized in a Departamento de Sinueve, 19th Department, who is a, an extension of the National Front of the Resistance in Honduras, who born with, with, with a coup d'etat the coup d'etat that happened in Honduras in, in June 28, 2009. That coup d'etat also um, gave born to the resistance in Honduras. There is a, a, a new party, a new alternative for the poor people called the Partido Libre, uh, because we only have two parties like in this country, the national and the liberal. So those are conservative, one is liberal and another one is nationalist, but the both are the same. <laughs> and then uh, the, the, the Partido Libre is the, the third option that the, the poor people now have to go to the election in November. And then we organize here to support the, the wife of Celaya because they don't want to allow him to, to come back to election. And then we are working in that. And that's what I am representing here. And that is another implication that if it wasn't for the... Venezuela and Bolivarian Revolution, we're not going to have a third option in Honduras. We have been living for 200 years with the National and the Liberal Party, you know, um, ruling the country, ruling the country, stealing the money of the people and selling the country like they do it now after the coup, you know, selling uh, the country in, in pieces, you know, uh, the, the, to the best offer people. And then uh, we um, organize here to, to, to campaign for, for this election that coming in November, you know. We never dreamed to have a, a, a party who, who really represent most of the poor people is there. Of course, they are division already because uh, the, the enemy want to, 
infiltrate people there and create the vision. And they have the media, they still have the, and we don't have a revolution, but we, we were very alive with Chavez when, that's why Celaya was overthrown, because he was very close to, Celaya, to Chavez, and he was implementing all this, uh, the, this mission that you see here, it's like 25 missions I have here, and I cannot, I, we don't have time to disclose every achievement of the mission. Every mission have an extension in Latin America and the Caribbean, have an extension like, like you know, the, the, mission, the mission for, for health care, for, for education, for, for, uh, for uh, food, all the mission work that agricultural mission for development of the, of the, of the, of the land and, and our country, all this happened in Honduras, even we didn't have the, the Bolivarian Revolution, but because we were alive with Chavez and supporting the, the the Bolivarian Revolution, we achieved this thing, and we have this thing, and that's why it scared the oligarchy there, and that's why it overthrew Zelaya. And soon came the, the attempt to overthrow uh, Rafael Correa in Ecuador in September 30, uh, 2010. They tried to overthrow him to, by police officer pushed by the oligarchy. It was kind of a trick that they wanted to make him and overthrow him. After that, in 2012, uh, last year, and in June 22, I think, was uh, the, the coup that type of happened in Paraguay. All this, this, this two coups, in plus the, the, the tenth coup that that in, in Ecuador happened because, because Hugo Chavez. That's why. It's, we know that because all these three, three countries were alive with Chavez, also with Brazil and Argentina, all these countries. UNASUR was created at that time, and all these countries were fighting through the ALBA, the Bolivarian Alternative for, for the Americas, were fighting against the IMF, World Bank, and all the policies of the free trade agreement that have been in place with the oligarchies of these countries. And then, that's why, you know, they were shaking and they say, this is coming, this is coming, and then it's in Central America and, and, and Caribbean. And even here, because Chavez also reached the United States, the, the, the most hostile country against the Bolivarian Revolution in, in New York, in Brooklyn, in Harlem, when, when the Bolivarian Revolution had been given gas and oil for the poor people for the heating of the house, because they don't, they don't can afford to, to, to pay the, the heating with, with the bill is too high. And the same thing with, with the Native Amer American Indian community here, he helped through the ALBA and through to the mission uh, with the oil and the gas. We have the Bolivarian Revolution reached El Salvador, Nicaragua, Guatemala, all those countries, the ALBA have been working, not only through, through the ALBA and the mission, but through Petro Caribe. You know, now the coup de Taco government in Honduras want to come back to Petro Caribe. That's why they went to the morning of Chavez, to try to contact Maduro and see if, if Honduras can come back to the Petro Caribe to get um, cheap oil. They say for the poor, it's not for the poor because it's a coup de tap government who is there, they're going to steal the money again, you know, we, we don't want that. He left an emptiness, you know, in Latin America, but he left a le legacy initiated by, by Simon Bolivar 200 years ago, and then uh, he continued that, that, that legacy of Bolivar, and then it's a spread all over, and then I think we're going to continue fighting against the same thing he was fighting, you know, as, as people from Latin America, fighting against uh, IMF, fighting against... Uh, oligarchies and elite ties to <coughs> greed corporations who only want to uh, profit to gain control and power and use the traditional political parties for remaining power, you know, and using the, and, they, they, and seeing the human being only as a profit, uh, as a way of make business, and then that's what we're gonna continue fighting, and I say, Viva Hugo Chavez, viva la Revolución Venezolana, viva, viva, long live to the working class in the United States and working class in America Latina, and thank you very much. Our next speaker is Joe Callahan from the Minnesota Cuba Committee. I'm honored to be part of this event, and I'm glad that so far no one has reported smelling any sulfur. It's <laughs> a good thing. I think Hugo Chavez lit up the skies in his efforts in defense of the oppressed, battling poverty, and U.S. imperial aggression. Venezuela and the world will never be the same. 
Venezuela is a diverse country. Hugo Chavez came from mixed ancestry, indigenous, African, and Spanish. He was very proud of his indigenous and African heritage. His family was so poor that he did not have shoes to go to school. His grandmother made him some cloth shoes, but those weren't accepted. His family had to scrounge up to get some money to buy him some shoes so he could even attend school. Now, that kind of poverty has been dramatically reduced in Venezuela in the last 14 years. They've created 4 million jobs, 22,000 state-owned grocery stores with subsidized food prices, and there's been an overall increase in social expenditures of 60 percent. Speaking as a uh, member of the Minnesota Cuban Committee, I'm going to talk some about the extensive relations between Cuba and Venezuela. Quickly after Hugo Chavez's election, tens of thousands of Cuban doctors, nurses, and teachers began coming to Venezuela, working in medical clinics under a program called Barrio Adentro, which provided care for 17 million people, compared with only 3 million people having regular access to medical care in 1998. And Cuban teachers are working in, work in schools in, in, in a program called Mission Robinson, which eliminated illiter illiteracy in Venezuela. Later, Venezuela began providing oil to Cuba, something that is very much needed there. In Cuba, the electrical power plants run on oil. Now, the corporate media here often presents the oil Cuba receives from Venezuela as a gift like it's a one-way street. Uh, to them, the medical care programs, the education programs for poor people that Cuba helps with in Venezuela count for little or nothing, certainly not in comparison with barrels of oil. <clears throat> but the Venezuelan people have a little different view of such things. Now, in 2002, I believe, Venezuela and Cuba, along with Bolivia, Evo Morales, initiated what they called ALBA, the Bolivarian Alternative for Latin America an alternative economic alliance. On the other hand, for the right wing in Venezuela, Cuba is the ultimate evil. During the attempted coup in 2002, right wingers gathered threateningly outside the Cuban embassy. I noticed recently, before Chavez died, there were right wing students camping out in front of the hospital where he was, and, and they had signs saying, no a la inherencia cubana. No to Cuban interference. Chavez was personally close to Fidel Castro and later Raul Castro. During the attempted coup, one of Chavez's daughters called Fidel Castro on a satellite phone. <coughs> it was relating events. Fidel put that call on Cuban radio and TV. And later he spoke on a phone with some military officers, Venezuelan military officers who were supportive of Chavez. The collaboration between Cuba and Venezuela was and is very important, but the most important thing by Hugo Chavez was his connection with the Venezuelan people. It was this bond that brought changes to Venezuela, defended them against the right-wing U.S.-backed attempts to overthrow Chavez and turn back the clock. So as John mentioned, during the attempted coup, the Venezuelan people massively took to the streets, marching on the presidential palace in protest and helped turn back that coup. The process in Venezuela, or Bolivarian process, truly is an inspiration, especially, but not only in Latin America. I remember, uh, in response to a particularly brutal Israeli round of repression, Venezuela withdrew its diplomats in, in, from the embassy in Israel. And I read a quote from a Palestinian saying, I don't want to be Palestinian anymore. I want to be Venezuelan. <laughs> The process in Venezuela has been inspiring to activists here, too. Take a speech at the United Nations. Uh, I remember the reaction of anti-war activists here. People were smiling from ear to ear. To me, it was inspiring to learn about, about the battle against the, uh, after the failed coup attempt, the attempt by Venezuelan capitalists to shut down the Venezuelan economy and strangle the government that way. The oil industry, as people have mentioned, is at the heart of the Venezuelan economy. Most of the supervisors, administrators, and technicians walked out, crippling production, which meant that the blue-collar oil workers had to step in and take on those roles as well. Also, the computer software was managed by an American company, which sabotaged the system before taking off. But Venezuelan techni computer technicians received assistance in reprogramming and restarting the system from computer technicians from Iran, 
Mexico, and India. And together with the efforts of the blue collar workers, gradually oil production was built back up. <clears throat> Tremendous solidarity exhibited by Venezuela's providing of heating oil to groups of native peoples, some other low income people, low income communities in the US is a very inspiring thing too. Capitalists and the media here scoff at these programs. Well, that's just publicity stuff. Well, why don't some U.S. oil companies want to get some heat? <laughs> yeah. I mean, they would say, uh, you want us to give oil to needy people? Are you crazy? <laughs> but looking to the future, I think the outpouring by the Venezuelan people after Chavez's death uh, shows not only their grief, but that their determination to forge ahead with what they call the Bolivarian Revolution, fighting for 21st century socialism. The new president, Nicolas Maduro, is very committed to this also. He uh, studied in Cuba some, and, and in, he also used to be a bus driver. And some of you know I've been driving <laughs> buses for the last six years. So I like that. It's rare to hear of a head of state from a background like that. The only U.S. president I've ever heard of doing any work was Abraham Lincoln, who famously <laughs> chopped wood into railroad ties. <laughs> Poll show Nicolas Maduro way ahead leading to the April 14th election. But the capitalist right wing, along with their godfathers in Washington, will not stop looking for ways to overthrow the revolution, turn back the clock, return all the decision making, and nearly all the money to the rich. That will stop only when the Venezuelan people put capitalism out of its misery there, nationalizing the major economic enterprises, fending off the resulting counter-revolutionary tax that will surely follow. And we have a big responsibility here in the U.S., I think, to work in opposition to U.S. aggression. The U.S., of course, was a big backer of the 2002 coup attempt. A documentary John mentioned had a little clip uh, from uh, a White House press conference in 2002 by Ari Fleischer, the White House press secretary. He's excitingly hurting up to the pro podium uh, Saying, this is very good, we support this. You know, that's what they call democracy after ceaselessly, ceaselessly calling Chavez a dictator and tyrant, despite the many electoral victories by wide margins. To them, nationalizing enterprises, increasing social expenditures is tyranny and dictatorship. One thing's for sure, sooner or later the truth will come out about U.S. plots against Venezuela. In the meantime, let's continue to draw strength from and to fight side by side with the Venezuelan people. Thank you. And now we're fortunate to hear from Juan Carlos Estrella, who is representing the consulate of Ecuador here in Minnesota. Thank you for inviting us. I didn't know that I have to speak, so I just want to highlight some important things that Ecuador has a really good wave, new wave started by uh, Hugo Chavez. The President of Korea was a, 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 is a friend of, of Hugo Chavez, but Ecuador is having a, a huge change due to this, more than this friendship, because they, uh, his ideas. This movement, this new wage, is doing really good job in the region, in Latin American countries, uh, main, main, mainly in the South America countries. And I, I can uh, note the change. It's, it's amazing change, because the most important thing of this new wage for the 21st century socialists is put the people over the capital. So this huge idea is changing the things in Latin America. I can see the change. I can see all the things, the socialist, um, the social things, the education, the health for the people is really, it's having a really important change. The President of Korea is working on these ideas. Uh, it's working in, in this uh, uh, new uh, ideology because it's, uh, all, it's changing the things. We know that every, every change has to, a consequence. Other people have a resistance for the change, but the change is good. The change is doing uh, very well in Ecuador. Uh, the, the foreign relations, as well as was mentioned before here, the relation with EMF, with the World Bank, has, have, uh, has changed. 
So um, I think uh, the uh, the social uh, matter is important in this global change. The capital is have affected so much of our countries. The capital is is uh, important. Uh, uh, it's deeper have a make deeper uh, consequence on our country. So I think this new uh, uh, wave, the new seed, is, uh, is important for the Latin American countries. This influence is over uh, to the uh, international uh, in integration system, like Alba was mentioned before, as soon as Ur. So I think the change is, is, is coming through. So we are expect more for this change more for the uh, the from the people like Hugo Chavez, like in Ecuador, uh, President uh, Correa, and for uh, uh, for like Ar Argentine uh, president as well. So uh, we have to to say thank you to Hugo Chavez because we recognize in Ecuador is recognized the leadership that he had. Uh, and the example for the other uh, leaders in the region like Korea. So uh, Ecuadorian people is really grateful with the Chavez life and the Chavez idea because he started all this new wave that is getting better for all our countries right now. Thank you so much. It's a really an honor to have you here. Um, our next uh, the speaker is going to be Car Carmen Gonzalez, who is with the Hands Off Venezuela Committee and uh, is a native of Venezuela. She is going to speak in Spanish and John um, will be translating for her. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Um, before John start um, doing the translation for me, um, we are here to celebrate the legacy of Hugo Chavez. But before we celebrate that, um, I just feel I just need to start my presentation saying the following. So, voy a empezar mi presentación con el título de una novela del gran escritor García Márquez. Oh, so I'm going to begin uh, speaking tonight with the title of a, a great novel by Gabriel García Márquez. Crónica de una muerte anunciada. Chronicle of a death foretold. No he conocido a un político que se le haya deseado tanto la muerte como a Hugo Chávez. I've never known of any uh, political leader who has had, uh, people have had such a death wish for him uh, other than Hugo Chávez, or as much as Hugo Chávez. Fue un hombre que prácticamente lo demonizaron. They, they demonized this man like no other. Um, hay que preguntarse por qué. Why, why was it? Why is this? Por qué. Y, <clears throat> y la verdad es que el pueblo venezolano todavía llora por este gran líder. But the reality is that ordinary Venezuelan people are still crying for this great leader's uh, death. Bueno. ¿Por qué se le odia tanto? So, en primer lugar, so why do they hate him so much? In the first place, acabó con la injerencia del Fondo Monetario Internacional. He, he cut off all ties and relationship and the burden that was uh, put on it by the uh, International Monetary Fund. Nacionalizó empresas. He nationalized industries. Lo que causó la ira de inversiones extranjeras. Which of course, uh, invoke the ire of all kinds of foreign uh, interests. Que todavía se vengan de una campaña de demonización. Who continue uh, to pour a venomous demonization campaign against him. En Europa y en los Estados Unidos. In Europe and in the United States. Venezuela es el país con las mayores reservas comprobadas de petróleo. According to OPEC, Venezuela has the largest proven reserves of oil of any country on earth. Ya no es Arabia Saudita. It's not Saudi Arabia any longer. Entonces, ¿qué pasa? ¿Por qué tanto odio? So why so much hate? Es muy claro. I think it's quite clear. 
Chávez desarticulizó el capitalismo. Chávez started taking apart capitalism. Pero no lo sustituyó. But he didn't substitute it with something else. Ese era el próximo proyecto. That's the next project. Polarizó las luchas de clases. He polarized the class, uh, the struggle between the classes. Y puso en guardia a las viejas y nuevas clases capitalistas. And he put the old and new ruling class on, on, on warning. Que por mucho tiempo tuvieron el monopolio. Because for a long time they had had a monopoly. De la comunicación social. Of, a, of communications, of social communication. Y el capital financiero. And of finance capital. En cierta manera, hoy en día, todavía, ellos siguen teniendo un poco el capital financiero. And they still, uh, to some degree, today, control of finance capital. Entonces, Chávez um, recuperó un proyecto de emancipación. So Chávez revived this project of emancipation. Que parecía sepultado. Which appeared to have been buried. Retomó conce conceptos censurados. He took up ideas that had been censored. Uh -huh. Revivió a los marxistas olvidados. He revived the ideas of Marxists who had been forgotten. Aunque él siempre dijo que él no era marxista. Aunque, although he himself always said, I am not a Marxist. Desafió la burguesía. He uh, rejected the, the hegemony of the bourgeois. Y declaró su admiración al pueblo cubano. And he declared his admiration for the Cuban people. Eso es suficiente para odiar un hombre. That's enough to make them hate this man. Chávez transmitió ideas de igualdad y democracia. Chávez uh, uh, put forward ideas of, of genuine equality and genuine democracy. Que provocaron un terremoto en la conciencia de los oprimidos. And this caused an earthquake in the consciousness of the oppressed. Lo que quería era una sociedad sin explotación. What he wanted was a society without exploitation. Esto, por supuesto, incomodó e incomoda. This obviously made and continues to make uh, those in power uncomfortable. No solo a los partidos del capitalismo serio. But, and not just the parties of serious capital. También molesta a los sectarios irritados. But also the little irritated sectarians. <laughs> con cualquier planteo desviado de su receta. With, uh, if, uh, if he did anything that didn't uh, fall in line with, with their preconceived notions. Entonces, Chávez rescató el socialismo para situarlo entre las posibilidades. So he recovered the idea of socialism and once again made it something possible. Mm -hmm. Inclusive, siempre decía que el socialismo es una democracia sin fin. He used to say that uh, socialism is an infinite democracy. Entonces, ¿qué pasó? Chávez logró una sintonía con el pueblo. So, what happened is that Chávez was able to achieve a real symphony, synthesis with the people. Y un impacto continental. And this had an impact throughout the continent. Uh -huh. Por eso se dice que el chavismo tiene alma. And that's why they say that chavismo has soul. Muy difícil de explicar para muchos teólogos de la iglesia. And it's very difficult, <laughs> very difficult for the conservative theologians of the church to explain this, this spiritual connection. <laughs> Chávez impulsó la integración regional. Chávez was an advocate and he, he worked towards regional integration. <coughs> Ahí tenemos el proyecto del ALBA. We have the project of ALBA, which was mentioned. Que lo creó en el 2005 con Fidel Castro. Which he created in uh, 2005 with Fidel Castro. El des Chávez decía la cruda realidad. Chávez put the bitter truth out there quite clearly. Él no ten, él no temía desafiar a los, a los poderosos. He wasn't afraid to challenge those in power. Mm -hmm. Entonces, volvemos a lo mismo. So we return ¿Por again. ¿Por qué este hombre era tan odiado? 
Why was this man so vilified? Entonces, celebrar el legado de Chávez, vamos a comenzar con el año 1999. So, to start with uh, celebrating Chávez's life, let's begin with 1999. Un año después de estar en el poder, And a, a year after coming to power, nacionalizó el petróleo. He uh, nationalized the oil industry. Pero cuando el pueblo empezó a escuchar, oh, otra vez vamos a nacionalizar el petróleo. And, and the, the people asked themselves, what do you mean, we're going to nationalize oil again? Porque en 1976, Carlos Andrés lo nacionalizó. Because in 1976, previous president, Carlos Andrés Pérez, had nationalized the oil. Lo que pasó fue que esa nacionalización fue solamente un título. But in reality, that nationalization was really just a label. Entonces, con Chávez empieza la verdadera nacionalización petrolera. Y nacionalizó PDVSA. And, but under Chávez, the genuine nationalization of the, the oil company, PDVSA, uh, took place. Entonces, PDVSA ahora es del pueblo. So, PDVSA, that's the state oil company, is now truly the people's oil company. Mm -hmm. en, en materia de salud, ya unos compañeros han hablado de las misiones. In terms of the... Uh, various uh, social missions uh, and health care. Other <coughs> people have already mentioned them. Eh, creó Barrio Adentro. He created this program, Barrio Adentro. Y la gente uh, que he escuchado de aquí habla, ¿y por qué con los cubanos? And people have asked often, well, why was it Cuban doctors that went to do this work? Él se sentó con los doctores venezolanos para hacer este programa. Chavez, he sat down with the Venezuelan doctors and proposed this program to them. <coughs> y ellos dijeron que los pobres apestaban. And they told him that poor people literally stink. <laughs> <laughs> y que ellos no estaban preparados para subir un cerro. And that they weren't going to go up into the, up into the mountainside uh, to treat these people. Entonces, ¿qué pasó? Chávez dijo, bueno, déjame hablar con Fidel. So Vamos a hacer un intercambio con estos, con estos médicos cubanos y yo les doy petróleo subvencionado. So Chávez said, well, let's see here. I guess I'll, I'll call Fidel up and uh, maybe, we can, <laughs> maybe we can reach a deal and they can give us uh, doctors and we can give them some, some oil. Y así fue como comenzó Barrio Adentro. Yo personalmente tuve una experiencia bellísima cuando voy a, a mi país y voy y veo a los médicos cubanos. And that's how Barrio Adentro began. And I personally, whenever I go home to Venezuela, I get to enjoy the health care provided by these Cuban doctors. Mm -hmm. En materia de vivienda popular, se edificaron 700 mil viviendas populares. Uh, as far as uh, housing goes, public housing, low cost, quality housing goes, they've already built 700,000 housing units. Y se siguen edificando. And they're continuing this. And these houses are free, by the way. Mm -hmm. En cuanto a la educación, la educación gratuita. As far as education goes, education is now free in Venezuela. Se crearon miles de escuelas. There have been thousands of schools thousands. that have been cr created. Um, la gente pobre que vivía en las áreas rurales nunca fueron a la escuela. There's Ahora van a la escuela. There are people in the rural areas who had never been to school before. Now everyone goes to school. Mm -hmm. um, también creó uni la Universidad Bolivariana. He also created the Bolivarian University. Y ahora se están graduando miles. Ayer se, graduó, se graduaron miles de doctores. And thousands of Venezuelan trained doctors are now graduating. Mm -hmm. Se crearon comedores populares. Communal dining halls have been created. Para los sectores de escasos recursos. For the, for the poorest uh, people in society. Mm -hmm. Aument, aumentó el salario mínimo. He raised the minimum wage. Y eh, el salario mínimo regio, es el salario uh, mínimo regional más alto según la, la OT, la Organización Internacional del Trabajo. And according to the International Labor, Labor Org Organization, it's the highest uh, minimum wage in the region. Uh -huh. Creó pensiones. He created pensions. En la Cuarta República, usted tenía 60 años y dejaba de trabajar y nunca recibía pensión. 
In the old republic, the fourth republic, if you retired at age 60, you didn't receive a pension. Uh -huh. Y Chávez dijo, hay que crear estas pensiones para las amas de casa. And Chávez also created pensions for housewives. Es, dijo, estas mujeres trabajaron toda la vida. So these women have been working their entire lives. Criando los niños, raising, lavando, fregando, cocinando. Raising the children. Ellas merecen una pensión. Cooking, cleaning, they deserve a pension. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. También, um, en, uh, se, en cuanto a la alimentación se refiere, se crearon, se creó Mercal, esa cadena de mercados. They also created a, a government-run supermarket chain called Mercal uh, for, for providing low-cost food. Mm -hmm. Y los supermercados Bicentenario. And there's also uh, the, the Bicentennial supermarkets. Uh, la oposición critica ferozmente estos mercados. The opposition fiercely criticizes these markets. Pero cuando empieza a anochecer, But when nighttime comes, es cuando ellos van a los mercados. They themselves go to these low cost markets. Y si encuentras una persona conocida, dice, oh, es que vine aquí porque no conseguía tal cosa. And if they run into someone they know, they say, oh, I don't normally come here. I just uh, couldn't, I, I just didn't, I needed one item. Uh, en cuanto infraestructura, se crearon muchas. As far as infrastructure, all kinds of infrastructure muchas has been developed. Muchas, autopistas, puentes. Highways, bridges. Uh -huh. uh, con respecto a la alfabetización, Alfe, eh, la, la misión Robinson alf, uh, se alfabetizaron un millón y medio de personas. In terms of uh, literacy, this uh, Robinson mission has uh, taught one and a half million people to read. Lo que llevó a la UNESCO declarar a Venezuela territorio libre de analfabetismo. And the UN has declared Cuba free of uh, illiteracy. Venezuela. Uh, Venezuela and Cuba too. <laughs> La tasa de mortalidad infantil bajó. Uh, infant mortality has dropped. De 19.1 por mil nacidos. From 19.1 per thousand uh, births. Uh -huh. Nacidos vivos. Live births. Uh -huh. En 1999, en 1999, it was 19.1 per thousand. A 10 a por mil en, tu, en 2012. And in 2012, it's a 10 per thousand. O sea, bajó. It's half. Por mm -hmm. toda la democracia, donde es más difícil de ser traicionada. He uh, consolidated democracy where it, it is the most difficult thing to be uh, betrayed in en el corazón de las clases populares. And that's in the hearts of ordinary people, where you can't get that democracy out. Y también donde la traición es más peligrosa. But it's also true that treason there is also very dangerous. Um, <coughs> y yo me pregunto hoy en día, ¿cuántos de ustedes han visto personas, miles de personas, desfilar y llorar ante una persona? How many of you have seen so many thousands and thousands country. of people in another country crying on the streets over someone's death? Mm -hmm. People traveling for, you know, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> Persona Gente viajando. viajando desde el interior. <laughs> People traveling from all over, from the mm -hmm. interior parts of the country. Les tomó dos días o tres días solamente para ver su líder por dos segundos. Traveling two or three days just to see his, his, uh, his body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Entonces, hay que preguntarse, ah, pero un hombre tan odiado, pero por qué tan querido por las masas populares? So, y this, por... so if this man is so hated, Why is it that he's so beloved by the poorest people in society? Mm -hmm. Entonces, uh, él impulsó Mercosur. He also pushed forward Mercosur. Que es el mercado común del sur. Which is the, the common market of the south. También creó la CELAC. 
also created the CELAC, la Comunidad de Estados de América Latina y el Caribe, which is the community of Latin American and Caribbean states. Mm -hmm. uh, también um, creó una su, una sur, sí. Also una sur, mm -hmm. another Unión entity de Naciones, una uh, Unión de Naciones Suramericanas, which is the Union of South American Nations. Mm -hmm. Eso fue en el 2005 uh, cuando creó Petro Caribe. And that was in 2005 when he created the Petro Caribe. Y ya sabemos que Petro Caribe entrega cuotas de petróleo subve subvencionadas al Caribe y a la cuenca caribeña. And uh, as we know, Petro Caribe provides uh, subsidized oil to, to countries throughout the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. El último plan, y no he nombrado a, a muchos acá, pero el último plan era el plan patria. And uh, one other plan is called the, the, uh, the, the Patriot Plan. Mm -hmm. Que su Chave dijo, lo comenzamos en el 2013 a, al 2019. And, and this is ongoing. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, they're, they're launching it soon, and it's supposed to run till 2019. Que establece el objetivo esencial de convertir a Venezuela en una potencia energética. And uh, the aim of this plan is to create Venezuela into uh, an energy resource powerhouse. Mm -hmm. um, Chávez prácticamente rompió con todos los esquemas de un dirigente político. Chávez uh, broke the mold when it came to political leaders. Mm -hmm. El pueblo se sintió aceptado. And ordinary people felt accepted by him. Mm -hmm. El pueblo prácticamente... Uh, se sintió respetado. Ordinary people felt respected. Uh -huh. uh, y, y eso dicen ellos que fue a través de Chávez que se pudo lograr eso. And they, they will tell you that this was as a result of Chávez. So prácticamente él introdujo un concepto desconocido. So he introduced an unknown concept. La dignificación del hombre. Which was the, the dignification of, of humanity. Ahora, la era post -chave. Now, we're in the post-Chavez era. El impacto de su muerte ha sido tan grande. The impact of his death has been so great. Que el día que Chávez todavía estaba en Cuba, que no se pudo juramentar para el próximo periodo constitucional presidencial. That on his inauguration day, when he was supposed to be sworn in for his, his term, his new term of president, he was unable to attend. He was still in Cuba. El pueblo fue a la calle. But the ordinary Venezuelan went out massively on the streets. Y se juramentó. And they swore themselves in as president. Y dijeron, todos somos Chávez. And they said, we are all Chávez. <laughs> Ahora, según los grandes políticos y todos los la gente que habla de la era post Chávez, todos dicen que lo que viene ahora es la consolidis consol consolidación. ¿Qué no puedo hablar? <laughs> Sorry. Ya, yeah. la consolidación del consolidación. Gracias del chavismo. And now in the post Chávez era. What, what has to happen in the next stage is the consolidation mm -hmm. of Chavismo. Y proba probablemente la radicalización del Chavismo. And uh, most likely the further radicalization of Chavismo. Entonces, el pueblo dice, estamos rodilla en tierra. And so the people in Venezuela, they're saying, we have our, our knees on the ground, literally as in... They've got their knees on the ground to defend y the country. La oligarquía no volverá. And they say the oligarchy will not return. Yeah.